All right, now the part of the chapter I want to focus on is that, that latter half of 2 Corinthians chapter 6, where it says in verse number 11, O ye Corinthians, our mouth is open unto you, our heart is enlarged. So Paul is pleading unto the Corinthians. He's saying, you know, we're speaking to you and our heart is enlarged. We care about you. We love you. He says in verse 12, Ye are not straightened in us, but ye are straightened in your own bowels. Now for a recompense in the same, I speak as unto my children. Be ye also enlarged. He, he's, he's speaking to them in love. Obviously, this is coming across. He's saying, look, you know, our heart's enlarged. I'm speaking unto you as unto my own children. I want you to be enlarged also like we are. He says in verse 14, and this is where he starts to kind of rebuke him a little bit. Not, not, it's not completely rebuke, but he's, he's just commanding him and telling him, look, verse 14, be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness? And what communion hath light with darkness? He's saying, look, you're saved. You've got the Spirit of God living inside of you. And he's saying, you know, don't be unequally yoked together with the unbeliever. Don't be palling around with this world. He's saying, you know, you're light. The world is darkness. The people out in the world are darkness. The unsaved, the heathen, that's darkness. What communion has light with darkness? So you're trying to mix two things that don't mix. He said, what, what, um, in verse 15, what concord hath Christ with Belial? Belial is just a, is a false god. It's Satan. It's a devil. He's saying, you know, what concord is, because he uses all these name, these um, synonyms, basically communion and fellowship, concord, agreement. It's all meaning essentially the same thing. So he says concord, it's essentially agreement. You know, what are you doing palling around with people who are of the devil or, um, you know, when, when you're of Christ? He says, or what part hath he that believeth with an infidel? Right? You're a believer. What are you, what are you doing hanging around with all these unbelievers and just they're your friends? This is who you hang out with. This is who you have things in common with are these infidels. Verse 16, And what agreement hath the temple of God with idols? For ye are the temple of the living God. As God hath said, I will dwell in them and walk in them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Verse 17 is where I'm going to get the title of my sermon this morning. He says, Wherefore, come out from among them, and be ye separate saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean, and I will the unclean thing, and I will receive you, and will be a father unto you, and ye shall be my sons and daughters, saith the Lord Almighty. There's a common theme throughout the Bible for God's people to be sanctified, to be set apart, to come out from among the, the, the people, to be different, to be a peculiar people. These are, this is a very common theme. God doesn't want us like the rest of the world. Yeah. He wants us to be different. He wants there to be a distinction between his people and everybody else. And when we talk about his people, we're not just talking about like physical descendants of Israel or physical descendants of Abraham. We're talking about, and, and you could, I, I've proved this in the past in other sermons, the elect are people who are saved, people who have received Christ as their Savior. Old Testament, New Testament, doesn't matter. When we put our faith in Christ, we become God's children. We are His. We are His children. We're not of the world. We're of Christ. We're of God the Father. That's who we are, and God wants us to be separate. Now, in the Old Testament, He, he did things a little bit different with the nation. He says, this nation is going to be different. This nation is going to have my laws. This nation is going to be a lighthouse of light shining in the darkness. Where When he goes through in, in Leviticus and he gives all these laws, and he says that people are going to see a nation that has these laws and go, wow, what a nation with understanding. Well, look at how wise and how smart they are to have these laws because they're from God and it's truth. I mean, these, these laws are truth. And... Um, the laws that, that Israel had in the Old Testament were different from the rest of the world. Now, some of them might have overlapped, I'm sure. You know, the, the little bits of wisdom that, that the heathen had picked up along the way. But it's only because that would be patterned after God's laws anyways. But um, God wants us to be different. He wants us to come out from among the heathen. If you're saved this morning, you know, you ought not to be like the rest of the world. And there ought to be a, a difference. Look at verse number 1 of chapter 7. He says, Having therefore these promises, dearly beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh 
and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. This is, one of the, this is what we need to do as Christians. We need to be continually, constantly cleansing ourselves from the filthiness of this flesh. Because let's face it, we still have the flesh. The flesh hasn't been changed yet. We've got a new spirit, but the flesh is still here. And the flesh is filthy. The flesh is sinful. And the flesh is what drives us into all manner of sin. And we need to continually be cleansing ourselves from this filthiness of the flesh and spirit and perfecting holiness in the fear of God. A proper fear of God is going to help you to straighten up your life and to get the sin out of your life. When you don't fear God, I guarantee you there's going to be a lot less motivation to get sins out of your life. There's a reason why the sins are in your life is because your flesh is telling you, hey, this feels good. I want to do this. So there's some kind of motive for you to sin because your flesh is, is, is still here and saying, yeah, I... I really want to drink, or I really want to do this, or I really, you know, I really want to watch this movie. I really, whatever the case may be, whatever the sin, it doesn't matter. The flesh is always there pulling you in that direction. And without a, a healthy fear of the Lord, yeah, so what if I sin? What's the big deal? That's the type of attitude that people get when you don't have the proper fear and respect of God. It's just like, you know, we're God's children. Well, my children ought to have a healthy fear of me and my wife as well because they can't just be like, yeah, I don't feel like cleaning the room today. No, I'm not going to do it. Because if there were absolutely no consequences for that, then why not? Yeah, I'll just, I don't need to do that. I know my dad told me to do it, but I don't feel like it. I, I want to go, go jump on the trampoline. That's what I, that's what I feel like doing. Well, no, one of the reasons why they do it is because there's, they have a proper fear that if they don't listen, there's going to be a discipline, there's going to be a punishment. And you know what? It's the same way with us as Christians. When we just disobey God, God sets up His commands, God sets up His rules, His laws, what He wants us to follow, what He told us to obey, and if we just be like, no, nah, I don't feel like doing that, you better believe God's going to bring a chastisement. He's going to bring a punishment upon us. And that's why we need to have this proper fear of God. It'll help you to, to stay straight, to stay doing what's right. Turn, if you would, to John chapter 17. Because so far, it's, it's been kind of generic. You know, how are we supposed to be different? Well, obviously, sin. You know, sin's bad. We shouldn't sin. But we need to be very specific. And it's going to be different in everyone's life, but... When, it, when he says, when, you know, when God's telling us to, to be separate from the world, what does he mean by that? Um, you know, we're not supposed to do things different just for the sake of being different. So it's not, he's not saying like, you know, be separate. And so, okay, well, we're going to be separate from everyone else. So we're just going to, you know, paint our house a real weird color. I'm going to, you know, do everything just completely different than other people just because I'm going to be different and because I'm going to be separate from them. It's not doing things different just for the sake of being different. The reason why you're going to be doing things different is because you're going to be doing things God's way yeah. versus the world's way versus Satan's way versus, you know, the way that's not right. So when we're doing things the right way, that's why we're, we're going to be different. Um, John 17, look at verse number 17. Here's this word sanctify. And that word sanctify, just, just in case you're not sure, it basically means like, Depending on the context, it usually means to set apart. You know, there's, there's, if you're sanctifying something, you have all these books here. Well, I'm going to sanctify this one. I'm going to set it apart and put it over here. That's, that's most often what it means, but I've also seen it kind of used in a context where it's like cleansing and making holy. Okay, when, when you're, and it's, it's all essentially the same thing, the same concept. You're, you're, you're setting something aside. You're setting something apart. God's saying, look, this is special to me. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to separate this from everything else. This is a people that I'm separating from all the rest of the wickedness in this world. This people is going to be special. They're going to follow my laws. They're going to do what's right. And so he's saying in John 17, 17, of course, Jesus Christ speaking, sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. So the way we get sanctified is through the word of God, right? That's when we get saved we are automatically sanctified, uh, and that's where the word saint comes from. It's, the word saint essentially means you become, you've become sanctified. 
We've become set apart. We've, we've been born into God's family. We are not children of the devil. We're not children of this world. We're a child of God. We're, set, we're special. We're different. We've been set apart. And that has happened through God's word. Um, and there's no other way that that could happen is other than through his word. But verse number 18 says, As thou hast sent me into the world, even so have I also sent them into the world. And for their sakes I sanctify myself, that they also might be sanctified through the truth. Neither pray I for these alone, but for them also which shall believe on me through their word, that they all may be one, as thou, Father, art in me, and I in thee, that they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that thou hast sent me. Um, turn, if you would, to 1 Thessalonians chapter number 4. I'm going to read for you from Joshua chapter 7. I've got a lot of scripture this morning about being sanctified, about being set apart and being cleansed from the world and, and being, you know, separate from this world. In Joshua chapter 7, we have the story of Achan. And when you, if you remember, right, Moses led the children of Israel through the wilderness and then right when they were going to get in the promised land because of the... Um, what happened at the waters of Meribah, Moses was not able to go into the land, the promised land, so because he disobeyed God, and that was his punishment. So Joshua is taken over as, as the leader, right? He's the one that's in charge. He's the one leading this whole, um, the, the whole, all the children of Israel in the promised land, and they're fighting, and they're having these wars, and they're conquering all the heathen, and, you know, and they're taking over and they're winning. These, God's fighting for them, right? It's very clear. God's with them. God's directing them. God's telling them, this is what you're going to do. You know, and they go to the city of Ai and, they, and um, the walls of Jericho and all these other places, right, where, um, where God's explaining what they need to do to win. And, um, but he, told, he, he gives them strict commands. He's saying, okay, when you go in, like these people are being utterly destroyed. Don't take their stuff. And, and I think it was the very first, the first battle. He's saying like, Everything is going to be burned. You're not taking a spoil. You're not taking anything for yourself. This is all being, being destroyed and demolished. You can't take anything. And of course, this man Achan, he, he ends up seeing and coveting and, and taking you know, some garments and some silver, and, and he takes that to himself. And this is a curse unto the whole, all the children of Israel because this man sinned. So this is in context now where we're catching up in this story. Joshua, because they, they lose in battle then. They don't realize this guy Achan is sin and has taken the accursed thing. They go into fight and they lose. And they're like, oh man, God, what's going on? I mean, you gave us this great victory. You said you're going to be with us. You gave us this promised land. Why are we losing now? And, and Joshua is kind of like on his face on the ground and um, just not understanding what's going on at all. And the Lord answers Joshua. He says in verse number 10 of Joshua 7, he says, And the Lord said unto Joshua, Get thee up. Wherefore liest thou thus upon thy face? He's like, get up off the ground. What are you doing on your face? Verse 11, Israel hath sinned, and they have also transgressed my covenant, which I commanded them. For they have even taken of the accursed thing, and have also stolen and dissembled also, and they have put it even among their own stuff. So he's saying, what are you doing? You know, get up off the ground. Hey, you're in sin. The children of Israel are in sin. You need to deal with this. You need to figure this out. Don't be, you know, crying to me about it. Fix the problem. Fix what's wrong. And this is the attitude that God's taking with Joshua here, saying just get up and fix the problem and deal with it. Verse number 12 says, Therefore the children of Israel could not stand before their enemies, but turned their backs before their enemies, because they were accursed. Neither will I be with you anymore except ye destroy the accursed from among you. Up, sanctify the people and say, sanctify yourselves against tomorrow. For thus saith the Lord God of Israel, there is an accursed thing in the midst of thee, O Israel. Thou canst not stand before thine enemies until ye take away the accursed thing from among you. Now, what we could take away from this is that this man had a sin. It was a secret sin. It was something that he was hiding in himself. But the impact of his sin, that affected everyone. It affected himself, but it affected everyone. He's saying, look, I'm not going to be with you as long as this accursed thing is among you. You need to deal with this problem or else I'm not going to fight for you. And we can apply this personally in your own life. What is that secret sin that you have? 
that, that, that no one else may know about. I mean, it doesn't, matter, hey, it doesn't matter if I know about your sins, right? I'm not the one that's going to be judging you. I'm not God. I'm not the one that's going to be disciplining you or have anything to do with it. You know, your husband, your wife, anyway, that doesn't matter. But what is your sin? Because God sees it. And if you want God on your side, you better get rid of that accursed thing. You better get it out. If you want God fighting your battles for you, you better get rid of that thing. Whatever point you're, you're at, when you have something, you know, from time to time, people end up doing this, where you're clinging to one sin, you're just clinging to something, you know it's wrong, and you just don't want to deal with it, you don't want to get rid of it, and sometimes people are even thinking, like, they'll go and be crying to God about it. Oh, God, I have this, I have this addiction, I don't know what to do, God's going to be like, look, just deal with it. Get rid of it. Okay, now look, you can ask God for some strength, but, but don't just have a pity party for yourself and say, oh, I don't know what's going on. Nothing's ever working out for me. Get rid of the accursed thing out of your life. I've seen so many lives ruined, especially by the sin of alcohol. I, you know, I've touched about this many times because this is something that's hit close to me personally in my life. But when people can't get rid of certain sins, they want to cling to that sin. Whether it's secret or not, it doesn't matter. They just want to hold on to that. It ends up destroying their life because guess what? God's not with them. God's not blessing them. That's why you're going to have all kinds of bad things happening to you. That's why your relationship's going to suffer. That's why you're going to have problems with your wife, with your children, with everything, with your job, with everything else in your life is because if you just want to hold on to this, this, this sin and you're going to cling to whatever that is inside of you, God's not going to bless you. He's not going to be with you. He's not going to fight for you. He's not going to do it. The children of Israel had to get rid of this, 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 this wickedness. I mean, this guy died. This guy had to, was stoned to death. They had to root it out. Not, not pick it apart just a little bit and be like, well, I'll tone down my sin. I'll just make it not quite as bad. No, you have to completely remove it and get rid of it. It's, it sin's like a cancer. You can't just get rid of some of it because it's just going to grow and fester and just get worse and worse and just and come right back and continue to spread. You need to eliminate all of it. It all needs to be gone. It all needs to be taken out. A lot of people don't like hearing the, the preaching on, on sin. And, oh, wow, we preach all this stuff about the law and you know, sanctifying ourselves and you know, this story about Joshua is in the Old Testament. You know, we just want to know what God's will is in our life, and we just want to do good and forget about all this negative stuff. Well, look at, you're in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. Look at verse number 1, because we're going to see what the will of God is in your life to, this morning. So if you've been wondering what God's will is in your life, we're going to answer that. So it's a good thing you showed up today. We're going to see what God's will is in your life. Look at verse number 1 of 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. He says, Furthermore, then, we beseech you, brethren, and exhort you by the Lord Jesus that as ye have received of us how ye ought to walk and to please God, so ye would abound more and more. For ye know what commandments we gave you by the Lord Jesus. For this is the will of God. This is. This, you want to know what the will of God? This is the will of God, even your sanctification. That ye should abstain from fornication, that every one of you should know how to possess his vessel in sanctification and honor. Not in the lust of concupiscence, even as the Gentiles which know not God. And he goes on and on. He's saying, look, this is God's will. He wants you sanctified. He wants you set apart. And just so you know, that he's not just talking about your salvation. He says that you should abstain from fornication. You don't need to abstain from fornication to be saved. <clears throat> But if you're going to be set apart from this world, you better abstain from fornication. That's a wicked sin. And not just fornication. We all need to know how to possess our vessel, our bodies, in sanctification and in honor. And if we're just looking at the body, that pertains to a lot of other things too. Keeping yourself healthy. You know, staying away from poisons like alcohol, staying away from um, fornication, adultery, uh, anything that, that pertains to God's laws and His commandments regarding your body. Hey, keeping your vessel in sanctification and honor. Not just keep yourself clean, but just, just things that are honorable. Right? Doing things that are right. And verse 2 said, you know what commandments we're talking about commandments. We're talking about obey, obedience to God's law for our sanctification, and that is the will of God. 
God's will for you is that you would be sanctified, you would be set apart into following the commandments of God. This is what we need more of. Verse number six says that no man go beyond and defraud his brother in any matter. Don't, don't be a cheat. Don't be cheating people and, and beguiling people and, and defrauding them out of something. You, you're coveting after something they have and, and tricking them and deceiving them and just into getting whatever it is that they possess that you want. He says, because that the Lord is the avenger of all such, as we also have forewarned you and testified. Again, now here we see that healthy fear of the Lord. Why should we not defraud our brother? Because God's the avenger. Because God sees what happens. You think you're so slick, you trick somebody out of something and they don't even catch on to it. And, and you're so smooth and you're, yo, you're such a great liar and deceiver. Well, guess who sees that? God sees that and he's the avenger of all such. Verse number seven, for God hath not called us unto uncleanness, but unto holiness. He therefore that despiseth, despiseth not man, but God, who hath also given unto us his Holy Spirit. We're saying, he therefore that despiseth, he's talking about despising God's love, you know, because he says, God has not called us unto uncleanness, but unto holiness, to be set apart, to be holy unto him. And if you despise that, if you despise that God wants you to be holy, he says, you're not despising man, you're despising God. Who's also given us the Holy Spirit? I mean, He's given us a great gift, and you're going to despise God. Turn, if you would, to um, First Thess or First Peter chapter one. First Peter chapter one, because there's so many areas of our lives that ought to be different from the world, and I've I've touched on a few of them, but I mean, really, there's there's an entire Bible's worth of sins that that we can go over. That we ought to be separate from the world and, and, and in obedience unto, unto God and the Bible. And any one of those is going to, you know, is a problem that we need to focus on. And again, I don't know your personal sins. I don't. I don't, I don't spend enough time with anybody in here individually except for maybe my family to, to really know what your sins are. So that's why we're just going to go to a bunch of scriptures and maybe something will apply to you and you could, and you could, I mean, hopefully not. Hey, hopefully everyone is just doing great and no one has this wicked thing in their heart that they're just clinging to. That would be awesome, but it's unlikely. And hopefully maybe we could touch on something today. If not, you know, you probably already know what it is anyways. You have a tendency to know what the things are that, that you just don't want to get rid of, that you, that, that you like, that you know is wrong that you know is something you're not, you're not supposed to be doing, whether it be, you know, your role, your function, your, your attitude, whatever, I mean, whatever it may be. 1 Peter chapter 1, look at verse number 13. He says, uh, Wherefore, gird up the loins of your mind, be sober, and hope to the end for the grace that is to be brought unto you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Here we see an admonition to be sober. Right? If you're... If you're getting high on drugs or, or drinking booze, you're not going to be very sober. You're going to be disobedient to this command of girding up the loins of your mind. It's important that our mind is sharp, that, that we, you know, we're, we're in a battle against the powers of the darkness of this world. Our minds need to be ready. Our minds need to be sharp and, and focus and intent on the Bible and on God's, and on God's word. And if we're not sober, our mind's not going to be sharp. Our judgment skills go out the window. We start to forget things. Um, you're not going to be able to rationalize things. Well, you're not even going to be able to make proper decisions if you're not sober, right? Verse number 14, as obedient children, not fashioning yourselves according to the former lusts in your ignorance, but as he which hath called you is holy, so be ye holy in all manner of conversation. So in verse 14, he says, as your former lusts. So the things that you used to do before you got saved, this is always a big thing that kind of stays with you for the rest of your life. Whatever sins that you were involved with prior to salvation and maybe even after salvation or whatever, those have a tendency to be the biggest stumbling blocks for people. And these are the ones you got to look out for. And these are, are things that, Hey, if you, if you haven't changed them yet since you've been saved, you better get focused on that and get that wickedness out of your life. But then look at verse 15. He says, so be holy at the very end in all manner of conversation. So not only should we be holy in keeping our vessels sanctified and keeping our bodies clean and avoiding the fornication and avoiding putting chemicals and, and poisons into our body, um, 
being sober, but also even just our conversation. How do you speak with people? What kind of things are you talking about? Now, here's the thing. When you're out in the world, how easy is it for you just to talk about anything? Will, will anybody ever even see a difference in you as opposed to anyone else that's out in this world through your conversation? Are you able to talk about all of the, the common things that, that people are doing today, whether it be the TV shows, the movies, the music, the, the I mean, wh whatever is in this world that people are, are talking about, and are you just going to be exactly like them, exactly like the world? Are you going to be using the same language as the world? As, and, and these days, I mean, it's, it's like profanity is just, is just littered with every other word sometimes that people speak. Yeah. Yeah. And is it necessarily a sin? I don't think so. I mean, unless you're taking the Lord's name in vain or blaspheming God, I wouldn't go as far as to say it's a sin, but that's not bringing honor unto Christ. That's not, um, you know, behaving yourself in a manner that a Christian ought to be behaving themselves using words that are distasteful and, and ought not, there's no purpose for them to be said in the first place. There's no reason to be, to be talking like that in this conversation. And it really just makes you look stupid anyways. It really just makes you look ignorant, uneducated, and dumb. When people throw around these four-letter words, it's like you have no education. Why would I ever want to listen to a word that you say when you're just spitting off all of this, this foul language? Mm -hmm. You have nothing useful to say if you're just going to be interlaced. And I don't care if you are smart. You sound stupid. And you're going to turn people off and make people not even want to talk to you because you have to use these words that, that there's no purpose for other than to offend people. What's the point? It's becoming so accepted in today's filthy society that you as a Christian, you ought not to have your conversation like the world's. Verse 16 says, Because it is written, Be ye holy, for I am holy. We need to be separate. Now, we're going to be looking, turn if you would to, I think we're going to 1 John chapter 2. 1 John chapter 2. You're in 1 Peter, so it's just real close there. Um, 1 John chapter number 2. Worldliness has, has greatly influenced Christianity today. And um, this is something that needs to be preached periodically. I mean, pretty regularly, actually. And this is something that we all need to examine in ourselves, how worldly we are individually. Now, what comes to your mind when you just think of, just, just for a second, I'm going to you know, give you a minute to just think about, when you think about the world, because the Bible doesn't give you necessarily the clearest cut definition of worldliness or what's in the world. It does. We're going to go over that in a minute. But just when you just think about the world today, we have the guy, we, we see what the Bible defines the things that are in the world as, and we're going to get to that in 1 John chapter 2. But um, when you just think about the world today, just the day that we live in, 2015, in America, you know, if you were just to say, well, something's really worldly, what, what does that really mean to you? Um, What I think is, is, is essentially it's anything that people are due or that's popular, that's, that's common, that is against what the Bible says. Mm -hmm. Anything that, that, is, that is out there that's contrary to God's word, sin, you know, all kinds of different things. And we live in a world today, I mean, just think about what are the common things that people do. And not, not everything that's common is wrong. That's why I said it has to be contrary to the Bible. Mm -hmm. So like... You know, talking about what's going on in the world, it's not a sin. Talking about the weather, it's not a sin. It's common, right? I mean, a lot of people do. They talk about politics. They talk about what's going on in the world. Um, there's nothing sinful about that. Talk about how nice it is outside. We were just talking about that this morning, right? Nothing sinful, nothing wrong about that. Um, so that I wouldn't call that worldliness, Right, but worldliness are things that are of this world. Look at, look at 1 John chapter 2. We'll get a better definition than the way that I'm trying to explain it anyways from the Bible, from God's word. 1 John chapter 2, look at verse number 15. The Bible tells us, here's a commandment. Love not the world. So we're not supposed to love this world. Neither the things that are in the world. So th the world itself or anything in it, we're not supposed to love those things. He says, if any man love the world, get this, the love of the Father is not in him. 
If you just love this world so much and you just think it's so great and you're so proud of the human race and just everything, man, this world is just great and I just love it. I love the things of this world. The love of the Father isn't in you. And of, you know, loving the things of this world, it's from this world. The things that this world generates, that this world puts out. The things that are not godly. Verse number 16 gives us a definition for all that is in the world. So these are the things that are in the world that we're not supposed to love. Okay? For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the pride of life is not of the Father. Sit over there but is of the world. This is how God's word defines things that are in the world. It's the lust of your flesh, the things that your, your body desires. You know, that would be the, the fornication, the drugs, the alcohol, the smoking, even, you know, I was talking to my wife about this, like listening to, to, to bad music, there's a certain kind of music where it just, you know, it, feel, it can make you feel real good but they're pumping your head full of a bunch of lies and satanic garbage that, that you ought not to be listening to and promoting more sin and more violence and more you know, disobedience and rebellion to God. Um, those are all things that are lusts of the flesh. I mean, it could, be, it could be even just being extremely unhealthy, giving yourself over to your appetite of your belly, you know, just overeating and gorging yourself. And, you know, all of these different things could be, they're, they're the lusts of your flesh. It's what your flesh really is driving you to do. The lusts of the eyes, right? Looking on things you shouldn't be looking at and lusting after them. Lusting after um, a person of the opposite gender, right? Well, God forbid, lusting after someone of the same gender, but that was, that's a... <laughs> That's, yeah. <laughs> that goes without saying, okay? But we're talking to normal people here, not reprobates. So the lust of the eyes, you know, looking on men and women, that's probably the biggest thing. But also just anything that you're coveting after can all go under the lust of the eyes. Anything that you look at and be like, man, you know, um, for an example, just to put it to you, you know, I, I, um, I have a humble income. If I were just to go out and be like, man, I really want to buy that, that Corvette or that Ferrari or whatever, you know, I mean, something that's just way out and I'm just looking at it and be like, oh, if I could just have this. Huh. That's a sin. Yeah. And you know, it's funny because most people, they, they don't even realize that that's a sin. Yeah. Like looking at those things, like, oh, I'm just window shopping. Well, if you start window shopping at things and just wishing that you had this and you know it's outside of your, your ballpark, you can't, you can't get it. Yeah. Don't even be looking at it. It doesn't matter. You, it's, you can't get it. Don't open up your heart to this covetousness of, of, of wishing you had something that isn't yours. Whether it belongs to your neighbor, whether it belongs to, to the salesman, whatever, it doesn't matter. When you start looking at these things, hey, that's the lust of the eyes. And that covetousness will, will lead you into all kinds of sin. The Bible says the love of money is the root of all evil. All evil stems from that love of money. And looking on material possessions can be lumped into the love of money because you need money to get those things. And when you start loving those things and those materials and just, man, that becomes your focus. I wish I had those things. You're going to be in all kinds of sin. And that's, of the, that's what the world does. This, these are things of the world. The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and then the pride of life. Right? Again, kind of being focused on your money, your material possessions, succeeding in life by just amassing all this wealth and having all this pride and also not humbly acknowledging God and, and, and giving God the glory, giving God the credit for whatever it is that you may have and just getting wrapped up in the pride of life, your pride, your arrogancy. Oh, I'm so smart. Oh, I'm so great. Oh, I'm better than everybody else because I have this multi-million dollar house or whatever, whatever the case may be. Whatever, whatever reason, you know, you don't even have to have all that stuff. If you just think that you're just such a great person and I'm so much better, you know, I, I don't care what income level you're at. That's wickedness and that's sin and that's the ideology of the world. It's a real self-centered type of philosophy that the world puts out. Be worried about yourself. Whereas it's the exact opposite of what the Bible says is to think on things of others yeah. and esteem others better than yourself. But this world will say, no, 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 you got to take care of number one. You got to look out for yourself. Anything you could do for anyone else, yeah, that's great. But as long as you are taken care of, that is the philosophy that the world puts out there. And that is the pride of life. Because you think you're better than everyone else. That's why you have to take care of yourself first. No. We ought to be, I mean, you take care of yourself, fine, but 
we ought to esteem others better than ourselves. That's the philosophy of being a minister, being a servant unto others, and helping other people out. Abigail, sit over here and don't move. Turn if you to James chapter 4. Again, it's just right back there near the end of the Bible. James chapter 4. It's just before um, the book of 1 Peter. James chapter 4. Verse number 1 says, For From whence come wars and fightings among you? Come they not hence, even of your lusts that war in your members. So the wars, the fightings that, that people have among each other. Elizabeth, go sit back there by mom right now. Go. Okay. From whence come wars and fightings among you? Come they not hence, even of your lusts that war in your members. Ye lust and have not, ye kill and desire to have and cannot obtain. Ye fight in war, yet ye have not, because ye ask not. Ye ask and receive not, because ye ask amiss, that ye may consume it upon your lusts. Now, he's explaining here, he's saying, well, where, where do all these fightings come among you? You have the strivings and fightings and wars. And he says, among yourselves, right? Uh, you could maybe apply this to the broad as a nation, but I think he's talking more specifically to people who are saved, to, to the church or to the brethren, right? That's how he starts off the book of James is to the brethren. And, um, and he says to the, that are scattered abroad, okay? But he's talking about these, these wars and these fightings. He said, all this strife, all the problems that you're having and fighting with other people, it comes from the lusts that you have in your own flesh. They come from your own lusts, your own desires, your own wickedness um, that's, that's warring in your members, within yourself. That's where these fightings come from. That's where, where it comes from. He says, you lust and you have not. You're looking at things and you want them. You're covetous. You want these things and you don't have it. You kill and desire to have and cannot obtain. He says, you fight in war, yet you have not because you ask not. Then he says, you ask and receive not because you ask amiss that you may consume it upon your lusts. Now look, first of all, we're trying to explain here. If you have a need, if there's something that you need, don't look on someone else who has what you have and go and try to take it by violence or go and try to, you know, to get it from them. Ask God first. If you need food, don't look at someone else who has a bunch of food and go over there and steal it from them. You pray unto God and say, God, I need food. Help me out here. That's who you go to first. And then he says here, you ask and receive not because you ask a myth they may consume it upon your lust. So he's saying, and then these other things that are not needful, they're not things that you have to have. They're just your fleshly lusts and desires to just have something that's if you get it, it's just going to be fulfilling on your lusts and not on something you actually need. Yeah, you're not going to get it. You, you could ask for those things like, oh God, just, just let me win the lotto. Let me win that million dollars. Look, you don't need that. Yeah, I could ask and I could ask all I want. I could ask so I'm blue in the face. It doesn't mean he's going to give that to me. Now, if I'm living righteously, the Bible says I'm not going to be begging bread. If I'm doing what's right according to God, he'll, he'll feed me. He'll clothe me. He'll make sure I'm taken care of because those are the things I need. And all I got to do is just ask him. Just ask him and you'll have it. But if I'm asking about the wrong things, about things I just, just want to fulfill my lust with, he's not going to give that to you. And, you know, when, when you're looking on other people's stuff, of course you're going to fight. You're going to have war. You're going to have problems. It's going to lead to strife and turmoil. And no one's going to be happy then. Not only are you going to be miserable, you're going to make someone else miserable. The guy who's got the stuff that you're looking after and coveting and trying to steal. Everyone's going to be miserable. Nobody wins in that situation. He says in verse number four, he says, You adulterers and adulteresses, know ye not that the friendship of the world is enmity with God. Whosoever therefore will be a friend of the world is the enemy of God. Now, the stronger words could not have been said. He's saying, look, you have a choice to make. Do you want to be a friend of this world? Do you want to just... In your life, be able to accept everything that this world has to offer. And when you're talking to people that, that are unsaved, that are in this world, just you get along just great. Everything is just clicking just fine. You, you could you right on board. You could spend, you know, you get married to one of them because you're 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 so you're so well aligned. If you're saved and they're not, there's something wrong with you. You are a friend of this world. Because the, the, the lost person does, doesn't know how to please God. 
They can't please God. They need to get saved first and then they can please God. Now, they may not be in the worst sins in the world, but, but regardless, they, they're not going to be... Um, they're in the world and they're going to be of the world. And we need to be able to make sure that we're not just friends with the world because then we're going to be the enemy of God. And, um, you know, you, one of the things I think of is how, how does the world get their entertainment? Right? What does the lost world do? Well, just, they've got Hollywood. They've got the music industry. They've got, um, you know, going out to, to bars and pubs. Um, you know, movies. Or, or this is what people do for fun. Right? I, I was in the world for a very long time. That's about, I mean, you could play some sports maybe. But playing the sports isn't, isn't bad because that's not contrary to the Bible. But going out to the bars and pubs, that is, that's, that's breaking God's laws to be sober and to, to not to even look upon the wine when it's red, when it um, giveth his color in the cup and move itself aright. Um, the movies and the music is full of adulterers and adulteresses. And you're and you're you're putting um, sin in front of your face, and and they're they're teaching you um, false worldly philosophies in addition to desensitizing you to sin. So you know, I would ask yourself this today: How much do you have in common with this unsaved world? You know, if you were to have an extended conversation with someone, just 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 a random person who's unsaved, would there be anything? that would stand out about your interests, your activities, the things that you like to do, the things that, 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 that matter to you, what you focus your time on versus what they think. Would, would there be any difference there? Or is everything just the same? I mean, for one, the, the, the people of this world in general, they're not gonna be very excited about church. Are you excited about church? Is it something to say like, oh yeah, you know, if, if you even talk to someone, is it ever gonna come up in your conversation? Is it something that you care about? Or is it just something that you feel like you have to do? And um, even just the way that you think about things, you know, you're, you're having a discussion, whether politics or whatever, you have a biblical point of view, I guarantee you're going you're gonna to be different than the way that they're thinking about things. Um, there's, so many, there's so many different ways where you should be able to spot a difference between yourself and the world. And, and it should be obvious. And... Um, the more right you are with God, the more different you're going to be from this world because they're at opposites. The things that are of God are not of this world, and the things of this world are not of God. They're completely separate, completely different, and completely opposite. So the closer you are to doing the things of God and doing what God wants you to do and obeying His commandments, the farther away you're going to be from the things of this world. I mean, he, he, he makes no bones about it. If you're a friend of the world, you're an enemy of God. You're going against God. It's one of the, Jesus said, you gather not with me, you're scattering abroad. If you're not on my side, you're against me. He that is not for me is against me. That's what he said. It's, it's always just clear cut. Look, you're either doing what's right or you're not. You're either a friend of this world or you're not. If you're a friend of this world, you're an enemy of God. How different are you? How separated are you? God tells us to, to come out from among them and be ye separate. Turn, if you would, to John chapter number 15. We're almost done here. John 15. John 7. Jesus said this in John 7, 7. He said, The world cannot hate you, but me it hateth. The world hated Jesus. Why? Because Jesus is not of the world. He says, Because I testify of it that the works thereof are evil. Jesus was separate from this world, obviously. He was God in the flesh. He was of God, not of this world. The world hated Jesus. Now, if you're following Jesus, and if you're doing what Jesus tells you to do, and if you're living your life in a Christ-like manner, and the world hated Jesus, do you think the world's just going to love you? No way. And this is a good mark. It, think about it. If the world is absolutely fine with the things that you do, with, with the things that you say, are you really following Jesus? Ask yourself that question and, and look at your own life and say, would the world look at the things that I do and the things that I say and have you experienced anything? I mean, Jesus was hated of the world. 
Why did he hate, they hate, the world hate him? Because he testified that the works are over you. Are, are you rebuking sin? Are you saying, no, that's not right? Are you at least speaking up and saying the things that you actually believe? When you do that, it's going to bring criticism from the world. I guarantee it. Because the world hates that. The world hates the things of God. The world is an enemy of God. Or you just not say anything. You might say, well, I'm not a friend of the world. You're not speaking up. You're not saying anything. Where's the difference? You may not be promoting the bad, but how are you really separate from them? Is that, is that the only way is that you're not just pushing for some bad things? Well, when you're silent, silence is agreement. And that's proven in the Bible, by the way. I'm not going to go through the, the time to do it. I think I've already preached a sermon on it, but when you go back in the Old Testament and when it goes through the laws about making vows. Now, when um, obviously the, the husband is the head of the household, the husband is the one that decides things. And we live in a backwards culture, so this is going to even sound foreign to, this sounds really foreign to the world today. But the Bible says that if the wife wants to make a vow unto God, between her and God. If the wife wants to make a vow unto God and the husband hears what she says, the husband has the opportunity to say, no, you're not going to make that vow. He has that authority given to him by God. And you can say, well, wait. But I mean, the woman's you know, making this vow to God. God has given the, the husband that authority in his household to say, no. Maybe it's a foolish vow. Maybe it's something he knows. You, know, you shouldn't be doing that. No. He has that authority. That alone, that concept in and of itself today would just make people go nuts. Yeah. And that's the same way, it's, it's the same way with his daughters. I mean, all the children in the house, but when, if a daughter wants to marry somebody, this is, this is where that old, that old fashioned tradition of, oh, what do you mean? You got to ask the father's permission. Yeah. yeah, you do. At least in this house, that's the way it is. Any, any man that's ever going to want to marry my daughters, guess what? They're going to be getting my permission. That's the only way that they're getting married. I don't care. They could be head over heels in what they think is love, in love with somebody. And if I don't think that that person is a, is a righteous man, I'm not going to allow them to get married. It's not going to happen. They're going to have to just move out and just completely be rebellious and do their own thing if, if that's ever going to happen. But it's not. I mean, I, I mean my, my girls are great. They're going to grow up in a godly home learning the things of God and be able to, to know these things. But God has given that authority unto, unto the man. And this is what, you know, the world hates that. They don't want to hear that, but that's what the Bible says. And, um, man, I don't even know how I started going off into this whole thing. What was the overlying principle for that? That wasn't in my notes, but, um, <laughs> the way that the Christian lives, the way, the things that, 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 the way that we view things is not going to be the same as the world. Oh, silence is agreement. That's where I got into that. Silence is, so... Good. <laughs> if the husband hears the vow and, and holds his peace, he doesn't say anything, that vow stands. He doesn't have to say, I agree with that, but if he decides not to like veto that, it stands. So that's just you know, evidence that, that, yeah, when you're silent in general, that's, that's agreement. If you have a bunch of people, maybe you're at work and they're, they're talking about some you know, all this, this wicked stuff and, um, you know, maybe they ask you something, you don't really say anything. You're agreeing with what, with what they're doing. If you're not going to say, no, that's, you know, that's not right. That's wicked. And, and you're going to not be very separate <laughs> from the world at all when, when you're not expressing just what's right. Now, I'm not saying you just have to be rude about everything and just really lay into people and tell them how, you know, especially when they're unsaved, how wicked and heathen and, and horrible they are and everything else. But if you're, not, if you're not stating the truth, if you're not saying what you believe and because you're afraid of what they might think or what they might say, hey, now all of a sudden you're becoming an enemy of, of God. 
because you're not you're not sta saying what's right and you're just going to be essentially giving your consent by um, by your silence to what that what they're saying is is right or true. John 15. Are you in John 15? Did I have you turn there? Yeah. Look at verse number 18. The Bible. Jesus Christ said again. He says, "If the world hate you, ye know that it hated me before it hated you. If ye were of the world, the world would love his own." But because ye are not of the world, but I have chosen you out of this world, therefore the world hateth you. Again, it's, it's this contradiction. Abigail, come up here and sit down in the front row right now. There's this contradiction of the world versus being of God. And Jesus Christ says, look, the world hated me. So if the world hates you, don't be surprised because it hated me. Sit down in the front row right now. He says, if you were of the world, the world would love his own. So what do you think that says about people who the world just loves? I mean, people who are in the spotlight, they get promoted on TV, and everybody just loves them, right? Are they really like Jesus? Are they following Jesus? No. no. Now think about, th think about this, because again, another thing that's going to ruffle some feathers in today's Christianity, what about these pastors that everybody loves? Turn, if you would, to Luke chapter 6. Luke chapter 6. Billy Graham, right? America's pastor. Billy Graham can be put on any of the TV stations today. He's not going to offend everyone. And what does the world think about Billy Graham? The entire Christian community, even those that aren't Christians, oh yeah, Billy Graham, he's a great guy. The world does not hate Billy Graham. Billy Graham has these meetings with the presidents and stuff, and he's you know, talking with all these popular people, and he's a popular guy. Do you, think he's, do you think he's an enemy of the world or a friend of the world? Sounds to me like he's a friend of the world. Look, the, the enemies of this world, they're not going to lift them up and promote them and give them all kinds of speaking time and everything else to influence the world. It's just not going to happen. They're going to hate him and try to crucify him. The more they're like Jesus, the more they're going to want him dead. Because that's what the world wanted with the most righteous man in the whole world, Jesus Christ. They killed him. Because the world is completely against him. And the more like Jesus a person is, the more the world's going to want you dead. And when everybody's just embracing you and just saying only nice things about you, well, let's see what the Bible says about that. Luke chapter 6. First, he says in verse 22, he says, Blessed are ye when men shall hate you, and when they shall separate you from their company, and shall reproach you, and cast out your name as evil for the Son of Man's sake. He said, look, when people don't even want to hang out with you, they say, you're not welcome in our company, I hate you, you know, your name, they're going to curse your name because you stand for Christ, hey, you're blessed. God says that is a great blessing. Verse number 23, rejoice in that day. He says, rejoice ye in that day and leap for joy. Be like, yeah, yeah, they hate me. I, they want nothing to do with me. They want me dead. I'm going to leap for joy. For behold, your reward is great in heaven. For in the like manner did their fathers unto the prophets. He said that's exactly what they did unto the prophets. They hated them because they were of God. They were real men of God that preached the truth. Jump down to verse number 26. He says, Woe unto you, woe, when all men shall speak well of you, for so did their fathers to the false prophets. You want to see a preacher, a pastor, a prophet? Everybody loves them. You just found yourself a false prophet. It's what the Bible says. Hey, when everybody's speaking well of you, that's why I'm not afraid today to say Billy Graham is a false prophet. It's evident. I don't care how many people love him. I don't care how many people think he did such a great job. Why do people love him so much? Because he's been pumped up in the media. Because people just think that he's led all these people to Christ and he's had all these big crusades where it's just ecumenical and just bringing in the Catholics, bringing in the Protestants, bringing in all these other people and just saying, I don't care, we're just going to bring everybody unto Christ. That's an antichrist movement, just, just trying to bring everything together regardless of the differences. Yeah. Regardless of, of the Bible, regardless of the word of God that you use, regardless of you know, how a person even gets saved. 
I mean, a Catholic doesn't believe the same way as a Baptist does about salvation, yet he wants to bring them all together. I think he even calls himself Baptist. False prophet. Rick Warren, false prophet. Yeah. Any of these pastors that are out there that are just loved by the world, hey, woe unto them. Woe unto them. That's exactly the way that the false prophets have been treated throughout time because they're of the world. The world loves them. Mm -hmm. The world cannot hate their own. Mm -hmm. But they're going to hate those that are of God. Our job is to be lights in this darkness. Turn, last place we're going to turn, Matthew chapter 5. This is a dark world we're living in. We do not want to be mistaken for being of the world at all. We don't even want to be close to it. Light and darkness are complete opposites. That's why we, we saw earlier on what, what concord hath, hath Christ with Belial, what agreement hath light with darkness. They have, they have no agreement. They don't mix at all. You have darkness where there's no light. As soon as you introduce light, the darkness goes away. It's one or the other. You, you, you either shine in the light or have in darkness. This world is full of darkness. We need to be that light. But if you live just like the world, if you're not just preaching the truth, if you're not saying the things that are, that are right and true from God's word, you're not shining that light. You're keeping that hidden inside of you. Look at what Matthew 5 verse 14 says. Ye are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hill. When you build a city and it's all the way at the top of a hill, hey, everyone's going to see that. That is standing up there. You can see that from far away. Hey, that's up high. Verse 15, neither do men light a candle and put it under a bushel. You light a candle in your house, you, you know, you're not going to be like keeping it covered. You, you're using that so you can see, right? He says, but you put on a candlestick and it giveth light unto all that are in the house. Everybody here is going to see that light. And that's the way we ought to be too, not holding back our light from anybody that all that are in the house may see. Verse 16, let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. So when just men in general, right, men of the world, when they see your works, well, you have to be doing some works in order for them to see them. And in order for them to make note of what you're doing, it's going to have to be different than what everyone else is doing. It's going to have to be according to the Bible, according to God's word. Verse number 17, he says, Think not that I am come to destroy the law or the prophets. I am not come to destroy, but to fulfill. For verily I say unto you, till heaven and earth pass, one jot or one tittle shall in no wise pass from the law till all be fulfilled. Don't be swept up in this garbage of people say, Oh, we're under grace, we're under law. Don't worry about that stupid law. Everything's just fine now. God abolished the law. No, he didn't. Jesus didn't come to destroy the law. He came to fulfill it. But it doesn't mean that, that we can just go around and do whatever we want because there's no such thing as sin anymore because there's no law. That's ridiculous. Of course there's still sin. That's why he tells us to be sanctified, to be holy, to be separate from this world. In the New Testament, we went to almost everywhere we went as New Testament. And that was on purpose. There's all kinds of examples in the Old Testament of people being sanctified and holy and separated. It's also all over the place in the New Testament as well. One last point. People like to, to then bring this, this up. I, and I, a family member got a book for Christmas and I was reading the, um, the summary on Amazon, what, what it's about. And it was, the only reason I was interested is because I saw it on their list and it was something that, that was about like witnessing the people or soul winning. So... I was like, okay, well, what, what are they going to say here? And I started looking at it, and they're giving suggestions about, like, hey, invite people over for a barbecue, and even if you don't drink, just provide beer. Like, if they, if they drink and everything, you know, just like... And what, what they do is they take, they take liberty with what the Apostle Paul said in 1 Corinthians 9, when he says, For though I be free from all men, yet have I made myself servant until I go through this whole thing. He says... Um, I am made all things to all men that I might by all means save some. Mm -hmm. So it's a common, a, a, you know, real popular verse that, that, that Paul said here. He said, look, I made all men that I might by all means save some. But what they fail to, to they like to focus on that one verse saying, well, yes, yeah, he do whatever it takes. 
Hey, if that means providing alcohol, if that means going out to a bar, you know, whatever. If that's going to get this person saved, then go out and do it. False. Because what they didn't do is read the entire scripture. I'll read it for you this morning because he says, For though I be free from all men, yet have I made myself servant unto all that I might gain the more. And unto the Jews I became as a Jew that I might gain the Jews. So he's appealing unto things that the Jews think of and that, and that they're going to be looking for. Okay, that's the way he appeals unto them. To them that are under the law is under the law, that I might gain them that are under the law. To them that are without law, as without law. But then in parentheses he says, being not without law to God, but under the law to Christ. So he's saying, I'll deal with those that, that are without the law. They don't believe in any of the law or anything like that. I'm going to be made all things to all men, yet I'm still going to be under the law to Christ, under the law to God. I'm not going to just break Christ's law just because they're without the law. I'm going to try to reach them at their level. I'm going to try to talk to them in a way that, hey, they don't believe in the law, whatever. I'm going to try to reach them, but I am not going to let myself be without the law to Christ. That is where they fail in this, you know, this book where they're, they're talking about all these different ways to, to, to soul in. And, and, and they're, like, they're promoting it, saying, oh, don't worry. Even if you have apprehensions about it, don't worry about it. Like, like, you need to become all men. Hey, this is for the greater good and all this other nonsense. No, we need to be separate. That's going to make a bigger impact. Look, it, it just makes sense. If someone's not saved... Don't you think they ought to see there's something different? And, and you don't want to be like, you'll be like, oh, well, I thought Christianity, like, I thought you weren't allowed to drink and like do all these other things. Oh, no, 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 that's just fine. Hey, we're just the same. All you just need is Jesus. Why would, how far is that going to get? First of all, you're going to be a hypocrite. Because the Bible does teach against these things and against these sins and everything else, you're just gonna you're just gonna be foolish and look stupid. Because not everyone that's unsaved is stupid. Just because they haven't received Christ as their savior doesn't mean they're a dummy. Right now, you can, in one sense, you can say they're a dummy because they should just receive the free gift. But they shouldn't. You know, it's not that they're just gonna be easily deceived or fooled. And they're going to be able to spot the hypocrisy. And that's why so many people aren't saved because they've been in churches where there's so much hypocrisy and they'll see, oh, the pastor's saying this and then he's doing the exact opposite. Right? And the pastor's up preaching against movies and preaching against Hollywood and then he's going out to the, to the Harkins right after church, you know, or whatever. They see the hypocrisy and that immediately turns them off. So when you say you're going to become all men, oh, so all the things that you think are wrong and you think are sins, now all of a sudden it's okay to just do those things just so that that person might get saved? That is not going to have that impact on that person. They're going to look at you and be like, you think this is wrong, yet you're going to do it? You know, in this circumstance, that's, that doesn't speak very well for your belief at all. I mean, if you truly have a conviction about something, if you have a belief about something, you shouldn't compromise that belief for any reason. If it's God's word and God's law, hey, that's what it is and that's what I'm sticking to. That's called integrity. People can spot integrity. Even people that disagree with, with someone who has integrity, they'll respect the person with integrity because they're consistent because they have that, that particular, particular belief. But these, the easiest way to determine these people are like by politicians. Nobody has respect for the politicians because they have no integrity because they change their positions all the time. One day they're pro-life, the other day they're pro-death. You know, one day they're, they're saying, you know, depending on what district they're in and, and what party they're a part of, they're just changing their mind and saying something just to appeal to however many votes they think they could get to keep them in power and to keep their, their gravy train rolling. That's all, and that's why people don't respect them. That's why I have no respect for them. You have people standing up and saying, this is what I believe. And like, like I would like to hope maybe it used to be at one point in this country where, where you could have a man of their word that would just say, this is what I believe. This is what I think. And if you think I'm the right man for a job, then do this because that's what I'm going to do. You're not going to get any, anything different out of me. And that's why with, with our, one of our recent elections with like Ron Paul, hey, you, think what you want about the guy. I don't care. 
I don't care if you agree with him, disagree with him. That man is a man of integrity. Yeah. He had a voting right, he had everything else, and he was one of the only, one of the very few people that were even left that that you know what he's going to do because you know what he believes. Mm -hmm. And that's the way that he was gonna he's gonna do things. And even when people disagreed with him, they treated him with respect because he was with consistent and he had integrity. This is the way that we ought to be in our Christian life. You don't have much integrity when you say, I I believe that this is wrong, but I'm still holding to it. And this is something that plagued me for a long time after I was saved because I love drinking alcohol so much that I would not speak about the Bible to anybody. Mm -hmm. I was just like the world. I was saved, yes, but I was an enemy of God because I was clinging to that wickedness that I did not want to get out of my life and it caused me to shut up and to keep my mouth silent about the things of God because I didn't want to be a hypocrite. Because I would think, why would anyone want to listen to me? I'm, I, know, I, I know this is wrong, but I'm still doing it anyways. And that makes you at enmity with God. For a long time, I lived that way. And guess what? I wasn't blessed at all. <laughs> Nothing good comes out of that. We need to just shape up, you know, whatever it is that might be in your house. Hey, be separate. Get the wickedness out. You, you know your life better than I do. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, I thank you so much for your words. God, help us to identify the things that, that are causing us to be at odds with you. God, give us the boldness and the strength and the courage that we need to, to retain our integrity, even in hard times, in face of persecution, dear Lord. Help us that we would never deny you, but that we would um, just stand firm on the, on the rock that you've laid for us, dear Lord. And um, help us to understand more about your words and help us identify the sins that maybe we don't even know are sins in our life, dear God, that we could become um, closer to you and be blessed by you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.